can talk and conversation, which is also one of um, the University of Johannesburg um, Six Research Institute. Um, we uh, welcome every one of you to this webinar this evening. The Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation is set to promote the political, social, economic, and cultural unity and self-reliance of Africa and its diaspora. Um, the Pan-African Women's Studies Unit, which is actually the host for tonight's event, is one of the many units within the Institute and this unit is actually dedicated to champion gender equality and women empowerment. Um, and to this extent, we seek to dedicate a research niche space to advance and advocate for African women's issues. The nuance on the issue of African nationalism continue to be a contextual debate among scholars and policymakers, and we hope to hear um, the current debate on Nigerian context when it comes to um, women and African nationalism. I hand over to the chair for tonight's webinar, Dr. Banda Njabulo. Um, Dr. Njabulo, over to you. Thank you very much. Dr. Banda, you are muted. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was speaking and speaking. Thank you, Dr. Oji. I was saying thank you so much for the for that nice overview of this webinar that we are about to get into. And I was saying that my screen might be a bit dark, my camera, but I know I'm audible and we are all very excited to get going. Um, without further ado, colleagues, I, I will introduce myself. As Dr. Ojo said, my name is Njabulo Banda. I am also um, at the Institute for Pan-African Thoughts and Conversation. I'm a research fellow there, but I'm also the head for the Public Health and Wellbeing Research Unit. She did mention that we've got a couple of um, research units. And so I head the Public Health and Wellbeing Research Unit, and I'm also excited today to be the chair of the session. Um, without wasting time, I would like to really introduce our first speaker, uh, which is Prof. Ma Maria, Prof. Maria Martin. Um, she is an, actually an assistant professor um, of African history and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California. She holds a PhD in African American and African studies with a concentration in history and women's studies and is known for her hip hop teaching methods. Very exciting, <laughs> Dr. Martin. She has also taught uh, in gender studies at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, where she also previously conducted research on Nigerian women's activism. Um, she's, um, you know, won a couple of awards. She's um, a Bill and Melinda Gates Scholarship alumni and has won four Fulbright Awards in addition to receiving an honorable mention from the Ford Foundation for her exceptional research. Dr. I mean, Prof. Sorry, Maria Martin, welcome to you and over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning from here and thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I am, you know, just very humbled to be in the presence of such dynamic um, organizers and scholars. So I'm very excited to be here to speak to you about my research. And this is something I've been uh, very invested in. I'm working on my book on this topic now. And I also have to just say a big shout out to South Africa, to the intellectual community in South Africa in general, because over the years, um, you've been very interested and you know very supportive of my research and have been inviting me and um, loving to hear from me. And so when the book comes out, uh, hopefully I will make South Africa one of my first stops <laughs> on the tour to speak about that. But today I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So I hope that I have the ability to share. Okay, so 
I'm just going to share and uh, present and jump right in to an overview of what I'm going to be discussing today. So I want to speak to the rhetoric of the non-political stance. And rhetoric is mainly, you know, we can boil it down to a more simplified definition, um, but it, there's definitely more to rhetoric. However, I see rhetoric as this persuasive communication. And it can be verbal, it's definitely verbal, linguistic, but it can also be nonverbal too. And so people use rhetoric to try to put forward their perspective and convince others of their perspective. So the question becomes, what are women trying to convince their audience of when they make these non-political stances? Then I'll speak to the rhetorical situation. So rhetorical situation is mainly the context under which this rhetoric was developed. And then lastly, I'll look at and speak to the function of you know, this rhetoric. So how did it actually serve women? So my objective is to analyze the function of, non, of the non-political stance. And really I'm looking again, I really wanna make this clear at the function of it, at what it achieved like, or what did women mean for it to achieve? I'm not defining non-political, political, or you know, I'm getting into that too much. Um, if you want to know how they define non-political nationalism, then you'll have to read the book <laughs> and that's going to come out soon. But today I'm just talking about the rhetoric and also the function of that rhetoric. So just keep that in mind. So now um, as a historian, I definitely have to give you some historical background on you know, this group. So I've been studying this group for a while now. Uh, the group is the Federation of Nigerian Women's Organizations. However, they did not start off as that huge umbrella organizations. Their background is more humble. Their founder is Olu Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, and she founded the group in 1944 as the Abekuta Ladies Club. And this club was, you know, women coming together to learn. She meant it to teach marriageable skills. So skills that women might need in marriage, right? So over time though, their intellectual development, their awareness grew. And so did the principles of their organization. So in 1947, they expanded to become the Abekota Women's Union. And now at that point, they were recognizing they had grown, right? So when people come together, there is always a consciousness raising. So they came together, they were talking about marriageable skills, but then they started talking about the issues that women face in society. And undoubtedly, colonialism um, came up as one of the important factors in the decline or the degradation of the status of women. So when they were talking about this, they started to organize around this topic, learn more about it, grow an awareness of it. And they started to say, okay, well, we need to raise the standard instead of letting it be degraded by colonialism. We need to raise the standard of womanhood in Abekuta. So that's what the you know, aim of that Abekuta Women's Union became. So in 1947, they actually led a war against colonialism. And that war was actually against taxation um, you know, of women during that period. So women were being so heavily taxed that they were being made um, an underclass or poor. And the market women definitely lamented this. Um, young girls would be stripped naked in the streets. There's testimony of this. I speak to this in my book chapter, Taming Cerberus. And um, young girls were stripped naked in the streets by these colonial um, tax officials. They were actually indigenous, you know, Yoruba or Egba men, but they were stripping these girls down to ascertain whether they were mature enough by looking at their bodies and their private areas were they mature enough to pay tax? Because this is how harshly taxed all the women had to pay tax. And so, or definitely all of the, um, you know, market women, uh, especially who were selling things and who had an income. 
they had to be taxed. So women, obviously this was an extremely, you know, offensive, degrading, you know, issue for women. And they started to fight back and push back against it. And just taking a more in-depth look at their development of this organization over time. So the group expanded even more right, especially when market women joined and they raised more consciousness about the impact, the, not just the um, impact on, you know, women in terms of gender relations and power, but also the economic and the social impact that this colonialism was having on the status of women. And so by 1949, the group was radicalized and it stood to defend womanhood um, by removing, by not only addressing the issue of colonialism, but by removing it. So now they're becoming more um, nationalist oriented. And so as their movement grew, they became an umbrella organization. And this organization in 1953 expanded to the Federation of Nigerian Women's Organizations. So they um, started to have many, many local chapters under this larger umbrella organization. And this organization is really fascinating to me as a Black Studies PhD. So um, I'm not a PhD in history. I concentrate in history and women's studies, but I am a PhD in African-American and African studies, so AKA Black Studies. And so I'm always interested in the connections and Pan-African connections and Black consciousness connections uh, between the continent and the diaspora. And this organization, the FNWO and uh, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, they had outreach not only in different parts of Africa, their international outreach was in Africa, but also outside of Africa in the US, um, in the Caribbean. I mean, you know, the wife, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, Amy Ashwood Garvey was also in conversations with Fumilayo Ransom Kuti about starting a transnational black women's movement um, that would, and that was definitely centering black consciousness and all of these wonderful things. So it's just such an interesting organization for me um, to study and to focus on. So this is the, you know, background. This is how they transitioned into this larger organization uh, with international um, impact. So Olufumilayo Ransom Kuti, who I mentioned, was the leader, the founder of the Abekuta Ladies Club, which became the Federation of Nigerian Women's Organizations, or the FNWO. She is an amazing uh, woman, uh, an amazing, you know, persona and I could say so many, so many, so many things about her, but she was a great orator, a mobilizer, an activist. She led the women's war that I talked about in 1947, which removed um, one of their, you know, one of their leaders, one of their community leaders at the time, and who was more supportive of the British and, you know, the colonial administration than the people. And then they also, so with their women's war, they removed that person, but they also set up a council that included women and included women's voices in governing the, you know, area, governing the society. And what that did, the first thing that they did, the first piece of legislation they put through was to repeal and remove the burden of taxation on women. So their, you know, their movement was successful. And uh, she, so she's been a political activist for a long time. And you might be thinking already, how is this possible that she is one of the most uh, politically active women of her time, also one of the most traveled women of her time going to different countries and talking about women's plight in Nigeria and finding out how to garner global support, um, you know, for African women. So you might be thinking, how is she politically active, but also supporting a non-political stance? But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. It's a very interesting, um, a very uh, complex, I think, conversation that we can have around that. There's always debates around that, but I'll get into that um, in a little bit. But so she is, she has been referred to as a feminist, a democratic socialist, and a nationalist. And so um, there's different characterizations of her activism. But one thing that one 
um, activist moment that I really, you know, cherish and remember uh, reading about her was during the Women's War, when all of the women came together in protest, one of the British colonial officials came down and told Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, also I'll refer to her as Miss Kuti or Fumilayo Kuti, uh, he came to her and told her, shut your women up. And she looked at him and she said, you were born, but you were not bred. Who raised you? Where is your mama? Who raised you? And she asked him, could you talk to your mother like that? And at the same time, the other women, you know, in the background, there were, there's a throng of many, many women, right? coming together because this was one of, and this episode really represents this pre-colonial activism of um, African women and the sisterhood that was a part of that too. Because if there was an insult to a woman and you know, scholars have been talking about this for a long time um, since the seventies too. But if there was an insult to one woman in a community, she could put out a call to women in her community that would reverberate in other communities. And then not only tens, not only hundreds, but thousands of women could come to her aid to protest for her because they understood as Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that a threat to justice or injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Injustice to one woman is a threat to women everywhere. So all of these women were with her, right, at this protest. And when she said this to this colonial official, the other women came together to say, who is this insolent white man? Remove him at once or else we will cut his penis off and send it to his mother in Britain, in England. And so it, it was, you know, even the rhetoric of that moment is very powerful. Um, and so this is kind of one thing that made me interested in the words of women and letting women speak for themselves. When they speak, there is power, there is understanding, there is engagement. So I'm just getting back to Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, she is this, you know, strong, magnanimous um, person who is standing up for not only women, but again, nationalism, the nation as a whole. So she participated in talks with Great Britain um, about Nigerian independence. She was a delegate of one of the largest political parties at that time, the NCNC, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons. So this is who she is. So now I want to just take you on a journey um, to introduce right, why I even came into this topic. So I'm going to share with you a little bit my research story. Um, so I became interested in this research when I was in my PhD program and I'm reading about Fumilayo Kuti and her activism, and it was really appealing to me. And I started thinking about what women contributed to nationalism, Pan-Africanism in the continent, uh, Black consciousness, anti-colonialism. And so when I you know, went to Nigeria on my Fulbright, on one of my Fulbrights, I was in the archive. And if you can picture this as a historian, um, as a, a lover of history, I was in the archives, um, the way that the archives were built, they were on the top of the library. And they, the, decoration right of the architecture allowed air to flow into the library into the archive so it was all of this warm breeze coming in and you know I'm there by myself in the archives just reading you know um, and I can hear the music that's being played outside I can smell the um, the puff puff <laughs> floating on the breeze speaking to me and smell all of the um, the delicacies that are being prepared at local eateries and you know the, so all of my um, all of my you know elements are just being engaged right all of my senses are being engaged in this moment 
And I'm holding documents in my hand from decades and decades and decades ago before I was even thought of, before I was here, you know, uh, when my parents were actually just being born. So, um, you know, so decades and decades back. And I have on gloves, you know, so that I don't get any oil from my hands on the documents. And so I'm reading these documents and I'm looking through, um, I'm seeing all kinds of things, finding all kinds of amazing things that I would love to talk about and write about. Um, I found even a newspaper about how Muhammad Ali came to, you know, Nigeria. And I was like, wow, because I'm also, I've been boxing for years and I'm also interested in that, but found so, so, so many different things, right? And then I'm looking at um, even just, you know, notes that she scribbled, that Fumi Laokuti scribbled. And I flipped over one of the notes and I found the number of Kwame Nkrumah on one of these notes. And I was like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I dialed this number today. <laughs> so I'm finding all these wonderful things. And I start to look, and I'm looking for, obviously, um, any engagement <clears throat> that women have with nationalism. So I start to see, you know, different things. I'm finding whole speeches, whole papers on nationalism and women. And I'm like, wow, this is great. And my research assistant at the time, Joseph Ayodoko, and he told me, go, just leave right now and go and write your, you know, your dissertation because I'm finding all these wonderful documents. And then I started to see these non-political statements and declarations. And I say, wow, I have never heard anybody talk about this. What is this? And what does this mean? And why are they making these declarations? And so that's what le led me into, you know, this research. But recently, um, I started to look at rhetoric and that became a new dimension for me. So last year I published an article um, looking at non-political nationalism as rhetoric. And so this made me, this dimension made me look more deeply at women's words. Um, it made me to view this non-political nationalism as a rhetorical device. And a rhetorical device is just a technique of persuasion. So how, how was this used as a technique of persuasion? So now I'm getting into different dimensions of looking at non-political nationalism and its function. So um, I saw that it was a move of women to reclaim, this non-political stance was a remove or, or a move of women to reclaim their collective authority while urging or negotiating with, um, and I'll get into the negotiation aspect because that's important, uh, but urging men to respect women's autonomy as nationalists. Uh, so that was something that I started to see coming out organically in this research. So this context, um, authority. So these women pre-colonial, in pre-colonial times, they had authority in their societies. They had political, social, economic freedoms and autonomy, but also authority right? Um, and their activism, so their authority was expressed through their activism. Their activism maintained equity in gender relations and ensured that women's voices would be heard. And so authority is not, or activism, is not always immediately confrontational. So negotiation was one of this, one of these, um, non-confrontational ways or in the beginning you know of the negotiation it can be non-confrontational but there were levels to it so negotiation was an important part of their activism negotiation was not passive right there were levels to it ranging from starting off with a conversation to going to militant protest right and physical interventions as well right so negotiation is also layered and you, it is complex and you have to understand that. So these women with this non-political stance, I see that a reclamation of their authority and also um, a reclamation of that authority through negotiation was a part of their activism, a part of this non-political stance. So it's a function of it, but negotiation, I wanna say a little bit more about that. Um, the women of the Federation of Nigerian Women's Organizations, the FNWO, use negotiation as one of the characteristics of non-political nationalism, and it was an important one. And when we consider Obioma Nameka and her 
uh, theory of nego feminism. It is a feminism of negotiation that she has viewed among African women. And then also considering Shirley Ardner, even back in the 70s, um, her work on Cameroonian women and their activism. When I consider these things, it seems that African women have used negotiation to make their grievances known while maintaining positive gender relations in their collective cultures. So collectivized cultures privilege togetherness and congeniality, right, and unity. So since negotiation is not immediately combative, it offers one the ability to advocate for themselves, um, but also to do so respectfully and in a in initially not in a combative way. Uh, so they advocated for themselves respectfully engaging with men in conversations about women's authority, women's autonomy, and, you know, trying to stake their claim as nationalists who should be respected and who should be able to work hand in hand with men, but also to build their own autonomous principles. So this is, you know, the language and the rhetoric of um, non-political stances or non-political nationalism, nationalism. So there is this respectful advocacy that is a part that I see in non-political nationalism. So now I wanna look at women's words. So, um, the FNWO was not the only and not the first organization to look at or to use, declare a non-political nationalist stance. The non-political ideology of the FNWO, it did not happen in a vacuum. It was actually, it came after that um, development of Elizabeth Adeyemi Adekogbe, who was the founder of the women's movement. She was also one of the few female civil servants in Nigeria during the World War II era. And so in this post-World War II era um, is what I'm looking at where women started to develop these non-political stances. So Adekogbe fought for women's suffrage, political representation, and the right to hold political office and founded the women's movement in 1952. So again, here we see these women who are saying that we support non-political stances or non-political nationalism, they are also concerned with political, right? Political uh, representation, holding political office, having political autonomy for women, building political awareness and consciousness raising among women. They are also concerned with that. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but she, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm just giving you a heads up that you've got about five minutes left. Okay. It's actually, yeah, thank you so much. No problem. So she ascribed to this non-political stance, right? So according to historian Nina Mba, Adekogbe said that while these nationalist parties, these women's wings, right, of these politically elite male-led nationalist parties um, are political, ours is not, right? And she said that we do not propagandize or support any party, although we have private leanings. Right. She wants to unite women, have a united effort of women, and that the problems of women are above party politics. So the function of this right, is that she wanted to look at building this women's movement separate from this politically elite male-led establishment. And that was so that women could organize and educate themselves and on you know, matters that were political that had to do with economics, education, but she wanted this movement to remain independent, right, in order to preserve its identity and dignity. So preserving the identity, dignity, and authority of women, right? So a central feature of this is that this was the beginning of this non-political stance and a central feature of it to me clearly is that it involved the preservation of women's autonomous identity and dignity. So that's a central feature of it. So when we get to Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, she prayed a prayer in Kaduna at a convening of the NCNC, another politically elite male-led uh, you know, group in Nigeria. And it was 1948. 
And um, she said that thou knowest why we have gathered here on this unique day from many parts of Nigeria. We ask of thee to come in our midst and direct all of our deliberations. Remove the spirit and feelings of tribalism and self. Unite us, O Lord. Make us to think and feel Nigerian. Instill in us love of freedom and work. Quicken thou the time of our national liberation. And then in the second part of the prayer, she says to stir up and spur the women to action, organize and unite them that they may be able to discharge duties that they are that are required of them and that they can act hand in hand with men to reach this goal of their ambition, Nigeria for the Nigerians. All right. So an analysis of this is that there are themes of togetherness, unity, one Nigerian identity, national liberation for Nigerians, but also some women's roles, central roles in achieving nationalism by, by acting hand in hand with men towards national freedom. That is a part of her non-political stance. So again, this is another declaration where she is saying that she's convening women, but this is not political. This is not a political meeting. So my analysis of this is that it is clear to me that Fumila Okuti, just like uh, De Kogbe, wishes to convey that the meeting of women, this convening of women is not political, but she masterfully um, in her words shapes and supports this idea by first using the language of sisterhood, civility, and collectivism. So bringing women together, though it is not political, and here, non-political functions to create equity and togetherness among women. So again, that convening of women, that sisterhood, recalling that pre-colonial sisterhood, um, is bringing women together from different backgrounds, right? So she's trying to create a movement of women that is equitable and that considers all of the different backgrounds, whether it is religious, economic, social, political, the different backgrounds of women. And she's trying to do this with this non-political stance to create a progressive movement of women. So when I look at this, this is another um, declaration of not being non-political that's coming from a Nigerian women's union, which operated under the banner of um, the FNWO. And so when I'm thinking about this, women were trying to persuade men with all of this language, right? They were trying to reclaim their authority. They were trying to negotiate with men to persuade men politically entering into a conversation with them first and persuade politically elite male-led groups to respect the dignity and autonomy and efforts of women nationalists, right? To, um, to act on their own. So some considerations that I think we should all have are for one, these male-led groups wanted to harness the power of women voters and organizers and they did not want women to have power in these political parties, though. So women pushed back against this by, um, you know, developing their own, you know, their own organizations and their independent stances and their non-political stances. So the climate at the time was highly rancorous, divisive, and patriarchal. So this was the atmosphere at the time, but women still wanted to be involved in nationalism and anti-colonialism and building up the society. So this non-political stance allowed them to do this by negotiating gendered power relations. So they are saying that we're gonna stand on our own feet and we're gonna have our own principles. We will work hand in hand with political parties, but we will not be involved in the divisiveness and the patriarchy and the highly rancorous atmosphere that these political parties are supporting. The other thing is that political, we can talk about this later too, but political is not universally defined. There is a general kind of understanding of it, but it varies with cultural context and with groups. And so we can, you know, even political scientists and uh, political theorists debate on political and the use of political itself. But another consideration is that it is important to note that this rhetorical stance did not mean anti-political. So, so non-political did not mean anti-political. It did not mean they were completely removed from party politics. So they could have their own personal political leanings. That's how Fumi Lai Okuti could be the most politically active woman in her time. But also as when, so there's this persona um, and this personal politics, but also collective. So there's a 
a personal leaning and a collective leaning. Personally, these individual women could, you know, be political, be in parties, whatever, be in the, the elite male-led parties, whatever, but in their collective group, they were to adhere to this non-political stance. And so this is why I want um, us to look at women's words and let the women speak, because if there are different ways of defining political, then be it also possible that there are differing views on what is and what is not political. And at this point, one must decenter their own views and allow the women who made these non-political decorations to speak through their archives. So what is left is to ask why and to understand why they developed this and what the function of this reasoning is. So non-political nationalism meant to be motivated by collectivism, equity, and freedom. So that's basically what they're trying to get at. So I can stop there and we can uh, move on to our conversation. Yes. Thank you so much, Prof. Martin. That was actually quite <laughs> an interesting presentation. Uh, you know, I was trying my best not to let my mind run. You know, as you speak, a lot of things come to one's mind, but obviously I'll, I'll, I'll kind of keep it in, inside for now. I would like to encourage our participants as well. I forgot to mention when we started the webinar that um, we are we do have a, a Q and A um, uh, section or sort of like box, if you can see. So if you can use that, I do have other um, some of my other colleagues that are helping us to manage that, and uh, Prof Maria as well. If you'd like, I think if questions pop up um, right now, even as the respondents continue, you can actually tackle some of the questions just in the interest of time, because you know it might be too long after. So please feel free to do that. But obviously, in the end, we'll also have a Q and A section where um, we'll entertain a few questions as well. So please use that chat chat. I think that we are all aware that um, uh, today's webinar, um, obviously Prof Maria was the presenter and we are also <laughs> quite privileged to have three um, uh, very lovely uh, respondents. So right now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Zainab. Uh, but before I do so, I'm gonna introduce her. Um, Dr. Zainab, um, she's a project officer in the litigation and implementation unit at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. She's also an assistant lecturer at the same university. She just recently completed her PhD in political science, looking at the impact of gender quotas on the substantive representation of women in African politics. Obviously her own doctoral thesis interrogated the assumption that women's increased participation in politics improves the lives of women substantively. Um, Zainab uh, was awarded the Margaret McNamara Education Grant for her impactful research um, on women and children. She's also a very enthusiast, enthusiastic and avid researcher who's published in various journals and book projects and policy briefs. She publish, publishes broadly on political thoughts, gender, representation, conflict, and peace studies. Uh, so without further ado, um, Dr. Zainab, over to you. You have got 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Good day, everyone. My name is Zainab Munusala Laito, and I am honored to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Professor Martin, for that um, presentation. It's like it's a, it's a it's a field I'm actually also like interested in and like enthusiastic on. And when we talk about you know um women's issues for example you know in your speech you were talking about how you know these women are to agitate for women's issues while not you know wanting to be confrontational why not wanting to be too out there and that's one of the things when we look at like women's uh, contribution during liberation period for example across you know african continent we look at how there's this dichotomy between um the politics of respectability and the politics of trans transgression and where prominent female nationalists are often, their, contribu their substantive contribution are often written off. So for instance, only from schools in Nigeria, as a Nigerian, what we are taught about her is that she was the first woman that drove a car, which is completely ridiculous because I mean, when we read what she has done in Nigeria, we look at all of the amazing things she has done in terms of like, you know, um, nationalist movement, you know, even the political, um, movement and also the independence agitation. And then we look at, you know, this aspect of non-political nationalism with the women's movement. And then we begin to ask ourselves, how are women 
recorded in history, especially during you know, the liberation um, era all over the African continent, but you know, looking at Nigeria specifically. And then my first point for you know my um, discussion will be how there is this you know very very worrying erasure of women's contribution to everything, even Pan-Africanism, for example, if we are to list you know, prominent Pan-Africanists, we'll probably go to WWE and name all of the men before we start naming um, you know, people like Rans um, Ransom Kuti, you know, Kesley Aford and all of like those um, women. And that creates like a problem when we are erasing women from the contributions that they are making to this very important um, 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 issues in our society, especially one that you know, formed post-colonial Africa or even um, post-liberation Africa. So we talk about erasure of women's contribution and oftentimes it is because, you know, this dichotomy between the politics of respectability and transgression. A woman like Ransom Kuti didn't care about established norms for women, for example. I mean, she's a woman that faced the alake of, you know, Egbalan during the um, revolt against taxation and they sacked the alake of Egbalan based on you know, the kind of politics that she played. Even though we can attest to, okay, yes, they were trying to be not confrontational, they, they were trying to be a little bit, okay, let's work with the men. But at the end of the day, the nationalism that they pushed for women issues got to the point they had to be, I don't want to use the word, they had to be very assertive in what they wanted, right? Because oftentimes, and which is also what my um, PhD thesis touched on, is this, you know, the substantive representation of we, we women, you know, we look at how women's interests are achieved in society. Oftentimes when women try to tone down the feminism, for example, when they try to tone down their politics, when they try to play nice to the male establishment to get what they want, they are often written out of their contributions to get these things. We talk about how Nigeria, Nigeria independence, they don't talk about how Fumilai Ransom Kuti was a very, very instrumental actor in this movement, they don't talk about Adoko Bwe from the women's movement for independence. They talk about Awolowo, they talk about Namdi Azikwe, they talk about um, you know, all of these men. So sometimes, <clears throat> even in their non-political you know, political nationalist movement, these women also had to be very, very assertive to make, to make sure that they got what they want. But in so doing, this politics of transgression that they embodied to get what they want during that time, also made it so that they were written off and written out of their contribution post-liberation. So when you go to schools in Nigeria, all of these things you talked about, they don't teach it about Ransom Kuti. In secondary schools, they only talk about she is Fela's mother and she was the first woman that you know, drove a car. And those are some of the consequences of this non-political. So even though they weren't political, I mean, Adekoba was trying to make sure that, oh, we are not political, we are just fighting for women's rights. We are not, but at the end of the day, this was still very much confrontational to the system because out there you fight for you know all of this right for women out there you want to speak when men are speaking and you know this whole politics of respectability versus um transgression and we can also see some blast of it with um Winnie Mandela also and how she was you know portrayed in the media for her politics for example because I mean you, you should just be an extension of your husband, who is the much, much more popular one. But this woman almost over outshined her husband with the kind of politics that she played. And then we saw how that narrative played out, you know, how the media portrayed her and the kind of narrative that followed even, you know, after her death, like five, uh, five years ago. So we look at the ratio of women's movement and we look at the role that, and how then, what they had in mind was less, you know, push women are doing that. Let's not, you know, let's not be too confrontational so these people can hear us. Let's not be too aggressive so they can. But at the end of the day, they still got to the point where they followed all of the, the, the negotiation, the conversation, you know, the, the diplomacy, but they still have to be very confrontational when we look at, you know, the Abad, Abad Women's Riot, for example, of 1919, and then we look at um, 1922, sorry, and then we look at um, the Egba Women's Revolt against taxation also um, later on. They still have to be confrontational. That shows how, now, which I move to my next point, you know, achieving women's substantive representation and why then they had to put it under non-political nationalism. So when we look at women's issues, I put that in the tab, and achieving women's issues, you have to go through the social justice route to achieve women. You have to make it so that it's a societal problem that everybody can relate to. You can't make it too feminist, right? Because people will be like, ah, then that brings like a negative connotation. So one of the you know, reasons for this non-political nationalism, I mean, I, I think also that we are focused on men's issues, the fact that women have to go the extra mile 
to get their um, grievances heard. So we look at issues like gender-based violence, we look at issues like sexual and reproductive health rights, we look at issues like femicide and all those harmful practices. They have to couch it as a concern that everybody can relate to. One, to get the collaboration of men and partnership of men, and two, to make it so that it won't be dismissed as, oh, it's not important. So when, a, like a woman like Adeko says, okay, we are focused on women's issues. First, they can get women across different social and ethnic cleaning. I remember Nigeria at that time was, very much ethnicized. I mean, we had the north, uh, the northern Nigeria, the southern Nigeria, even within the southern Nigeria, we had the middle belt, we had the southwest, and in the north, we had the east. We had like there were a lot of like divisions. But when you say women's issues, nothing unites women across different social political leanings, like when you put women's issues and you say we are non-political. Now, and that brings us to this idea of substantive representation, which I'll now draw from my PhD. So findings show that. When women come together outside of political leanings, they are much more likely to achieve better results in advancing you know, women's issues than when they go um, you know, with party lines. So when you are political with you know, advancing women's issues, you don't get much result because then each person would be loyal to the party mandate. But when female politicians come together based on, we are fighting for women's issues, we are putting aside our party, um, leanings we are putting aside our party mandates, they can achieve more. And we use, um, for instance, the women's caucus in South Africa, for example, you know, just to deviate. There's a multi-party women's caucus in South Africa, for example, that looks at women's issues. So every female parliamentarians, irrespective of their party affiliation, is part of that caucus. Now, we can't say that caucus is apolitical, for example, because I mean, the basis upon which that caucus was formed is because they were participating in politics, right? But the essence of that caucus would be non-political because they place women's issues above their party mandate. So when they are discussing within the caucus, for example, they put women's issues above um, party mandate. But at the same time, there are still certain um, situations where party mandate gets you know, in the way of what they are doing. But it is beautiful to see that such platform exists where not political ideologies can be advanced and how women's issues, for example, are always couched in a social justice manner to ensure that they don't offend, you know, predominantly the male establishment in society. Because when you're fighting, for example, to advocate for, you know, um, less gender-based violence, they will be like, okay, we don't always have to point men as the problem, even though we know men are the problem. So the way they couch these issues, the way they couch this language is also similar to what happened, you know, during um liberation period in Nigeria, where these women were like, okay, this uh, is what we stand for. We are not going to align, um, we are not going to bend on that ideology. What we want is sisterhood. You know, these are also languages that we can find in like for you know drawing comparison now in you know the South African multi party women's caucus. This this whole idea of sisterhood, this whole idea of civility. We don't want to fight with the men, we want to be collaborative, we are not confrontational, we want to ensure that they are able to um what's the word, they're able to give us what we want. And now going back to Nigeria, this um this need for collaboration is also what the reason why in the Nigerian um, Legislative Assembly, a bill was introduced to recognize um, discrimi um, discrimination as you know, a human right and then to ensure, um, so the bill is called Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill in Nigeria. The bill was rejected. And one of the reasons it was rejected is this whole idea that men were not consulted when the bill was being crafted. And that you know, takes us to why women then in the liberation era felt, okay, we need to collaborate with men. We need to at least converse with them. We need to not be confrontational. So they can at least join us in this um, advocacy and ensure we get substantive results. The bill was rejected and senators, like male senators, male house of Rep said, oh, how dare they create a bill and men were not consulted. We need a collaborative approach to you know, ensuring we have gender equality in Nigeria. So, I mean, I'm sure women now in the in this um, current uh, political um, dispensation can learn from like the non-political ideology that women in the liberation era took, you know, to achieve a lot of what they achieved. Because when you talk about women's contribution in Nigeria's um, liberation era, you talk about the Abba women's riot, for example, you talk about the Egba women's revolt, and you talk about how these women were also part of like a lot of social justice issues that affect um, that affected women. So we look at uh, Oyuko Abayomi, we, uh, who um, created hospitals, who um, 
their girls' education. These are issues that can be called as women's issues. And I think the approach that it took to advance those Zainab, issues. Yeah. Sorry to disturb you. Um, your time's up, but I'll give you a minute to just sum up. Okay, so I'll just wrap up. So, uh, so what I'm just saying is, first, the idea of you know couching women's issues in a social justice language, and secondly, the erasure of women's contribution and how that creates a dichotomy between the politics of you know the transgression and respectability, and how beautiful it is that oftentimes women have to couch their needs in a non-political, non-aggressive, and textured nature for them to achieve substantive results. I will end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zainab. I can see that you still have a lot more to say. But yeah, the, the conversation continues. And again, just to remind our participants that if you're having thoughts right now, um, please use our chat um, our chat uh, um, sort of um, uh, uh, box to, to drop your questions. We are also quite fortunate to not just have only women speak on this issue. <laughs> we have a gentleman with us, Dr. Philip. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for a view from the male perspective. Dr. Philip is a coordinator of um, the West African Transitional Justice Center and is also a senior research fellow at this <laughs> institute, which I'll just summarize as the IFR, IFRA Nigeria at the University of Ibadan. He has recently served as a consultant um, on the UNDP Anti-Corruption Initiative Project and on um, the Media and Terrorism Projects for the Center for Journalism, Innovation and Union Commission on the Validation of the African Tran Union Transitional Justice Policy Guide. His PhD was in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of Ibadan as well, where he also taught um, as an agent uh, at the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies and the Cultural and Media Studies Program. He's a member of the Nigerian Army Resource Center in Abuja and has done extensive research on the friction between local vigilantes and state security apparatuses in Nigeria and across the ECOWAS corridor. Um, he also belongs to, you know, a couple of other interesting sort of um, um, uh, units, um, such as um, international associations, including Action Research and the Rights Collective of the University of Dayton and the Perpetrator Studies Network, which, which partly focuses on abuse, abuses by the state agents during conflicts. Um, and then just to close off, I do want to say that his recent uh, research is focused on the social implications of technology, whilst most of his interests really are across the field of transitional justice, security studies, ethnicity, and transnational relations, and of course, gender studies, which is why we have him today. Um, Dr. Philip, over to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me. Too. We can. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So um, it's a privilege to be to be asked to, to speak um, here. I thank um, Dr. The Institute, of course, um, especially Dr. Joe for inviting me. I've actually known her all my life since um, we went to the same Northern Primary School. So <laughs> just um, say thanks. So I couldn't say no when she invited me to speak here. Um, what takes me back um, in terms of my memory, um, at, um, the last time I was at the forum, um, like this, sandwich among um, um, great women scholars was um, when I attended the CSVR event in Uganda, um, where they were trying to mainstream gender into um, the African Union you know, traditional justice policy. And then I was told that I was going to pay for the sins of my forefathers, and um, I had to be careful with my utterances, um, and I was able to navigate the waters. So I was, I'm hoping that today I'll also be able to at least say something that's worth the while, you know. Um, thanks to, to the speaker, Professor Martin, for um, our research work, um, and also um, Dr. Zainab for the very great intervention. I'll just start from the point of view of rhetoric, which she, she mentioned. And this is actually my conclusion, um, because I'm going to link this up with solidarity, you know, at the end of my speech. But just to say that when we talk about rhetoric, rhetoric has to do with um, a recollection of memory. I think um, a literature that comes to mind is um, Nathan Justin's um, Actors of Memory, you know, where he was talking about the core of the rhetoric profession being the, the myth of Simonides that he was trying to rewrite, you know, in his work. And why I'm bringing this up is the fact that 
when it comes to the non-political aspects that has been explored, you know, in the talk today, um, when we look at the respect for self, you know, address and respect for others, you know, being living in community, whether you're looking at it from the local context or from the Pan-Africanist view, then it has to do with leveraging on collective memory, you know, as a way to drive, you know, persons forward. But I'll come to that, you know, much later. Now to speak to some parts of the presentation that caught my fascination, I'll start with the, um, the, uh, the groups that founded the, the Fed Federation of Nigerian Women's Organization. And um, one thing that caught my attention was the fact that um, the group was basically founded for um, skill, skill acquisition to talk about women issues and trying to like drive them. And I think that fits into Dr. Zainab's intervention of creating a broader, you know, um, social justice issues in trying to navigate um, the ways of asserting the presence of women and even their rights, you know, within patriarchal, uh, patriarchally dominated society. Um, one thing that I remember is also that working on a paper recently on the context of education in Ghana and Nigeria during the the interwar period. I mean, between the first war, Great War and the Second Great War, they call it the Second World War, but I'm trying to like counter that label in, in my work. And I, I noticed that there were specialized education for women. Part of it was that during that era, um, people complained that um, ladies who went to school were not able to like manage their homes, right? I'm just reporting, I'm not holding any position just to lay the disclaimer here. And so they had to like introduce as part of the curriculum for teaching in, in, in colleges, or no, not colleges, in high schools, um, secondary schools. Let, just, let me just use the term that I'm more familiar with, you know, to talk about, um, to develop a curriculum to teach women on um, basic skills of even raising homes, because they found out that people that were educated, you know, at that time were not able to um, take care of their own all their marriages together, or they weren't even getting married. So there was like a conflict between getting married and getting educated. And so you could see the reasoning in 1944 when the Abel Ladies Club decided you know, to talk about skill acquisition, which was also like a form of empowerment. But another dimension to it would also be that perhaps those who belonged there and were educated also needed to learn skills on, on marriage, like um, it was mentioned. During, during the lecture. So that um, caught my fascination to say that these realities, you know, were across borders. And perhaps if we looked at what happened in Ghana at this time, perhaps we would have had similar initiatives of women groups like this, you know, trying to like create a collective where they can, you know, um, help to navigate some societal stereotypes, you know, in that period. The second thing that caught my fascination also because of some of um, my activities within the security sector, was um, the fact that um, women were subject, where women, the female body was objective, um, were objectified, you know, and they were subjected to some kind of dehumanizing treatment, not just by colonialists themselves, you know, but even by indigenous people who were working for the colonialists. And um, I just wonder what would have been responsible for this kind of practice. And I draw my inspiration from um, my own work, you know, um, having um, studied a bit of um, the dimension of feminism among the Yoruba, you know, to see that um, some scholars like Sophie Oluwole, like um, um, even Fadipe, um, who wrote the sociology of the, of the Yoruba, have spoken about how the language, you know, of Yoruba was gender neutral, and that was because creating discrepancies or creating the difference or the divide between both sexes was not something that was conventional. So, other than um, some words that were just used to designate, you know, so, um, some sexes, basically the language of the Yoruba was like gender neutral. And this fits into the culture, if you believe that language is a vehicle of culture. So um, that experience for me, would have, and, and I'm not denying the fact that there may have been some oppressive practices, you know, within um, the patriarchal society of most Yoruba um, contexts. But um, my own experience of from research also, you know, shows that 
shows that um, the Yoruba were add value for women. You know, people like Bolan Leawe spoke about uh, Sophie Uluwale as well, how women go to the market and men were not expected to go to the market, not because women are seen as inferior, but this was a role that women were really, and they, 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 they had different other skills, you know. So my point here is just to say that perhaps you need to interrogate what the practices were before colonialism and what they were, you know, after the colonialists came, the, the different eras, you know, perhaps there were some practices that were more or less accentuated uh, or, or heightened by the presence of, by colonial presence, perhaps people looking for validation within the new political arrangements and, and stuff like that. So that's my own um, reading of, of the activities of men in that era. And I'm not speaking to defend them. I'm just saying that there are still some, you know, societal contexts that could have influenced such treatments. Perhaps if we have records of that within the pre-colonial period, perhaps it could negate um, some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, also to, to, to talk about the markets, I think, um, she spoke about how market women um, were, were, you know, part and parcel of these groups. And, and from my experience, also doing a bit of research in the market, the market has been a, a place for a, a, a central place where, where of, of political activities, of social expressions, you know. And I think um, there needs to be more studies on, on how, how the market has, you know, um, played this role. I, 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 I also remember engaging, you know, some studies on, on the market. And I see that um, from even my own um, experience growing up, there were some social ties that were formed with trade partners, you know, you know, which transcended, you know, even buying and selling to attending events, looking after family and stuff like this. And these were basis of, a community and solidarizing that I'm going to, you know, end my intervention, you know, with. There was also the Pan-Africanist perspective, which I think you all know better than myself. So I'm going to, to skip that. She spoke about um, Tumla Ransom Kuti and uh, attributes, which has also been very well documented. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to, to talk about is the methods that this, the method, I mean, it was just one method, negotiation, which is actually, I mean, from conflict experts uh, perspective, we see uh, as a conflict management mechanism, which is also very vital. Trading concessions, you know, from different um, angles, you know, in order to navigate your way. And I think that was what um, Dr. Lighton was talking about when she talked about couching or framing and women issues within the broader social justice issues. Of course, there could be no environmental or social justice as some women advocates are projected without the protection of women's rights. Um, so the aspect of negotiation also brought me to um, the, the bill she, she spoke about. I hope you're talking about the same bill that was recently uh, rejected. I think I was, I was part of some meetings on, on the bill. And I told um, I, and I told them the danger from my own perspective on that bill. And the question I, I wanted to I posed was, um, what are you negotiating for? You know, if you're negotiating, for instance, within the federal the legislative assembly, you're le negotiating for a particular percentage of seats, and that is written into law. And I told them that a uh, uh, paradventure when. Um, women have more capacity to go beyond maybe the 35%. If this had really been written into law, some male uh, will, um, you know, reference the law to ensure that women do not get better seats, you know, within the National Assembly, which I think was something that also created some controversy in Nigeria at the point. So negotiation could be very tricky, especially when one um, is not very futuristic about the aspects of negotiation. And I'm not saying this particularly to talk about um, the women organization that we're talking about today, but just to lay it bare as a method of engagement, you know, negotiation and trying to negotiate your, your way to power, trying not to be confrontational, talking your way to power, which, do, the, which has to do with a lot of trading of concessions, you know, and how, um, how what, what is, what are, what are the future implications of whatever you agreed to? You know, we have a lot of laws that have been passed and none of them have been very effective. And some of them have even been used against, you know, um, the people. Look at the, the inclusion, for instance. That's of, uh, yeah. 
Uh, your time okay. is up. Please sum it up. Okay, so let me just round up with the with yeah. So I just round up with my point on solidarity, which is my final point. So um, I know that the uh, people are big in terms of the new movements that have been created, especially in Europe, about the concept of solidarity, which goes beyond the phenomenology of the self to also talk about considering yourself as part of others. And I think the essence and relevance of this women, women, women's group that we're discussing today would be the aspect of solidarity within a liberal form of you know projecting projecting feminism consideration for self respect for self within the consideration for others as community relying on collective memory you know to be able to advance um, the issues and the causes of women thank you very much for the opportunity yeah Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Philip. Thank you for that um, uh, wonderful perspective from the from the male side. So I hope colleagues, you can see a pattern already from our speakers, starting from our presenter, you can see the, you know, the depth and ideologies and exactly what, uh, you know, from where the movement started. That's what I'm noticing. And then moving on to Dr. Zainab, you can see that she starts to unpack some of the not the problems, but some of the challenges with some of the, the approaches, but also what we should think about and why that certain approach was being taken by the, the, the women's movement. And now Dr. Philip, from the male perspective, you know, also pointing out some of the things that are not necessarily the fault, because, you know, so usually when we talk, talk women's movements, we think that um, there's something wrong that the men have done but we sometimes you know ignore the context and some of the issues that are affecting and are causing some of the the the, the misalignment you know amongst us so it's quite interesting for me to to listen to the speakers so far colleagues we have our last um um respondent dr Dokas. thank you so much welcome dr Dokas is um is our um, uh, senior lecturer um, in political science at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. She teaches um, postgraduate modules and supervises masters and PhD students. She's currently um, the coordinator of the um, Conflict Transformation and Peace Studies program in the School of Social Sciences. I um, mean, her own PhD that she holds is in Conflict Transformation and Peace Studies from the University of KwaZulu Natal as well. And her master's also in political science from University of Windsor in Canada. She has worked previously in training, policy development and research. She has worked in the African Center for Constructive Resolution um, of Disputes in South Africa and also the Legal Resources Center in South Africa. She's also worked in the Interagency Child Protection Assessment um, uh, Coordinator as, sorry, an Interagent Child Protection Assessment Coordinator in Northern Syria. She um, has published widely um, uh, and some of the, um, her work is in peer reviewed journals and, re in, um, her, and her research really covers immigration, human security, identity politics, governance and African politics. Dr. Dokas Etang, thank you so much for joining us. Your 10 minutes starts now. Great, thank you very much. Um, just a correction, I worked with the interagency coordinator um, in that office. Um, I would like to thank my fellow panelists for a really great um, conversation and uh, perspectives on the theme. And I just want to pick out four key points um, from the paper. Um, I think the first thing is we can agree that women have played key roles in Nigeria's political and economic development. Um, and we can trace this from the pre-colonial to post-colonial periods. If we look at the pre-colonial era, we see that women were engaged in various decision-making structures. Uh, if we look at the Igbo culture, for instance, women were administrators and elders. In the Yoruba culture, women played critical roles in political and economic life, uh, with accounts of women holding prominent roles as chiefs and rulers. And then if we go forward into the uh, post-colonial uh, period, we see that um, authors like Sophie Oluwole discusses how pressure groups organized by women became human rights organizations, promoting democratic principles for both men and women. Peter Eke um, identifies traditional women's movements as one of four core civil society organizations that emerged in post-colonial Africa. And so we can see that um, through history and, and um, the point by, by um, Zainab about how these have not been documented um, is quite critical. But if we look at um, various sources that have tried to capture this, women are key players um, in Nigeria's political and economic development. Um, the challenge perhaps then is, is this the same now 
or have we sort of lost the plot when we look at Nigeria's current uh, political um, dynamics? Uh, so when we talk about the engagement of women, the second point is women have perhaps been more active non-politically. Um, and so what do I mean by this? Um, women in Nigeria have found ways in history and now um, to effect change and negotiate various interests outside of politics. At the community level, at grassroots level, we see that engagement um, in activism, um, volunteerism, entrepreneurship. We're seeing that women are quite active um, non-politically. And so... Um, participation can be civic as well. And I think this is where women have sort of found the space um, to engage. Um, and so it's not a political nature, um, but more of a civic uh, nature in many uh, cases. And so there's a strong argument that transforming ideas around patriarchy involves engagement in non-political spaces, uh, churches, local communities, um, transforming culture. This is where uh, non-political spaces or non-political approaches um, can perhaps bring about change. And so the value of non-political engagement is uh, to avoid polarization and to avoid division. The third point I would like to, to bring out from um, the presentation is, is the restrictions on women. And in spite of, of, of significant efforts to, to effect change and to negotiate change, we see that these restrictions have persisted. Um, during the colonial era, we see increasing efforts to in exclude and subjugate women. Um, the colonial era, we see uh, where systems that socialized society to see women as inferior and second-class citizens emerge. This is in education, religion, identity, social networks, um, patriarchy, misogyny, and the idea that women's rights are linked to their husbands um, are all uh, the forms of restrictions that existed then and, and, and are still uh, present currently. And, and we must note, however, that women did oppose the colonial way of ruling through various protests. Um, moving forward, the, the uh, post-colonial space, we're seeing that women have had to face increasing um, restrictions. The constitution itself is, is one that is, is, is argued as, as anti-women. Um, social spaces, cultural language, political leadership, these are all restrictions that continue to exist. And so they've limited women as active political stakeholders. And what happens is the voices that exclude women, be it through the constitution, be it through legislative houses, um, these are the loudest. Uh, and these are sort of the ones that are shaping the, the agenda. And so today what we're seeing are women are still negotiating their rights, even though we've had great examples from the different presenters of how they've had to overcome these challenges. Um, these are some of the realities. And so currently, for example, you know, the low numbers of women in political office and political space, there are different challenges from the unfavorable political landscape, social issues, financial constraints, and so on and so forth. And I think for me in conclusion, Going forward, what lessons can we take from the past on rhetoric and negotiating spaces and how can we draw on that um, for women in Nigeria's political space right now? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Tokas. That was actually under the allocated time and thanks for the correction in the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, colleagues, this brings us to the end of the, um, the formal presentations. As you've heard, our respondents have responded and you've heard um, Prof. Maria, she gave her presentation. Uh, I've seen um, two questions in the chat box. I think Prof. Zondi was one was being attended to, um, but I can read it um, because now I don't see the answer from Prof. Maria, unless she, maybe she just wants to um, just um, say it um, for everyone to hear. So the question from Prof. Zondi is, uh, um, he says, greetings colleagues, I was wondering if it's possible for the first respondent to address, okay, this is not from Prof. Zondi, sorry, I'm somewhere else. There's one that has answered. So Prof. Zondi, your question has been answered, sorry. And the one that's still open is saying that um, there, uh, the, this um, a participant is wondering if it is possible for the first respondent to address specifically Dr. Martin's insightful paper. I think the first respondent, that one is referring to Dr. Zainab. 
And then we'll also be taking hands, colleagues. I don't see any at the moment. So I think um, Dr. Zainab, you can maybe um, tackle this question whilst we um, wait for the hands. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, let me switch to my video. My intervention to her presentation was on two um, levels, which I you know, stated when I was speaking about one, the erasure of women's contribution um, during the liberation period, and two, the reason why women often have to take the non-political route when they are you know, advocating for women's issues and how you know, that um, often take a social justice um, <clears throat> language route, which is what like other respondents have also alluded to. So in our uh, presentation, she talked about you know, the women's movement and you know, the use of um, rhetoric and non-political ideology, particularly to advance causes that uniquely affect women, and particularly looking at Adip Kogbe, for example, the women's movement, and now they were very specific about what they wanted to do and why they didn't want to align with the action group, for example, and which was what my intervention was on about, you know, how now in current, like in, um, uh, in contemporary times, we've seen semblance of what, you know, took place during you know, the liberation movement in Nigeria, where we take a leaf from the women's caucus in South Africa, for example, and how you know contemporary Nigerian um, the gender and equal opportunities bill, not you know, we are not learning from that process or not you know including men in the consultation of the bill led to the bill being rejected. So you know, just drawing um you know parallels between you know what has been um, applied from that period now and sometimes. Um, failures of not applying such principles. So th those were my intervention to our presentation and you know, drawing from our presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Zainab, for that um, response. I see a hand from Ambassador Jerry. I will give um, yeah, you a chance, but I think uh, if, if there's no other hand, we'll maybe just go back to Prof. Maria and see if she can elaborate on the response that she gave to Prof. Sondi's question. Um, Ambassador Jerry, over to you. Can, can you hear me, uh, facilitator? Dr. Now Jabs? Now, now I can, before we had no, struggling no, a bit. Th th thanks very much for this conversation. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Professor Martins uh, a simple question. If, whether from her own analysis, given the history that she, she shared with us, the issue of non-political, was it a question of strategy or was it a principled uh, position uh, of that time? Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Banda. Prof. Martin, you can respond. Okay, I'm so excited about all of the conversation that's going on here. Uh, could you please repeat your question, Mr. Majila? You said, uh, uh, was it a privileged position or was it? No, no, Prof. Martin, I was saying, I was very interested on these uh, non-political positions of the Women Federation at that time. So the question I'm asking is, was this a deliberate issue of strategy uh, by the women at that time, or was it a principled position they took for mm. them to pursue um, and realize some of the issues that they wanted to take at that time, given the context mm. of the history? This was in Nigeria at that time. Now, I, I, I don't know if I'm very clear on my question. Okay. So, thanks, thanks. yeah, thank you so much for that question because that does help us to drive deeper. Um, that's a question that I have not <laughs> got before, um, but I really appreciate that distinction. You know, so was this on principle or was this about strategy? So, you could say that it was both. I mean, because if you have principles and you want to press forward your agenda that is based on your principles, right? Or on your moral standing, you will have to strategize. You do have to strategize. But I think that you were asking whether this was just a strategy to advocate for themselves or were they actually coming from a genuine place of principle. That's what I think you're asking. 
you can definitely correct me if I am. Um, yes, no, you are right. That's exactly what I'm asking. Okay. Yes. Yes. So definitely you have to strategize and no matter what you're going to be doing. But I do believe that they were doing this out of principle. And the fact that they called it non-political, I mean, um, how much time you get? Because I, like, I really want to respond to uh, Ms. Zainab and one of her comments about being non-political to basically appease male, the male egos and having to um, be more passive and things like that and not as assertive. That's not what it was about, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so with you, in your question, Mr. Majila, yes, I believe that they were definitely doing this from principle. And the fact of the matter is that in a very highly politically charged atmosphere, if you want to be relevant in that atmosphere, it probably would behoove you to say that you are political too. Why would you now say that you're not political unless you have a definite clear vision of your morals and where you want those morals to take you, of your principles and what you stand on and what you believe that you can achieve with those principles. So they had to be locked in, you know, to that, um, to those principles, to that moral compass. They had to be locked in in a sense that they were standing on principle, standing on morals, standing on the fact that they believe that this position could be, is a viable one in this battle for liberation, for freedom in this nationalist moment. And I right. think that, I believe that because they're going back to what um, Dr. Philip was saying, the women, so, you know, I love that he brought up the question of what was happening in the pre-colonial and how could that help us point to, you know, um, an understanding and gain awareness from which to understand what's happening in the post-World War II and the colonial era. Um, right. Because in, in, my, in my talks that I've done before in South Africa, Prof Zondi knows that I'm developing a theory around this. And in order mm. to develop that theory of gender activism, I had to go back to the pre-colonial. And when I did that, I saw that there were specific ways, specific activism that women engaged in and negotiation uh. was a part of that. Right. Mm. And we see them, you know, porting that negotiation and porting other aspects of their pre-colonial ideology of gender, their pre-colonial activism. They're taking that and walking with it even in a colonial moment. So that to me says that they are locked in with the principles of their culture. And one of the principles, going back to what uh, Dr. Philip was, you know, alluding to, one of these pre-colonial principles in Yoruba culture that I have come across in uh, my years of studying the culture and gender and gender ideology is that there is a belief that men and women are equal opposites. And uh. um, yes, they're equal opposites. And so women are investing in nationalism in a way that is different than men, though they are still, you know, both engaging with nationalism. There's this equal opposites kind of tendency there. Men are doing the political, women are doing the non-political. Men are really engaged in this, um, in European methods. Women are engaging in indigenous methods towards liberation. Uh -huh. Oh, uh -huh. yes. I believe that they are doing this out of principle, but I'll leave that there because I definitely also want to respond to uh, Ms. Zainab. And I really appreciate that uh, what you said about you know, non-political, because it can be seen as if women are doing this because they want to um, get around the male ego, but that's not what they're doing because non-political could also be very, very assertive to say the least, okay? Um, in that colonial moment, when there there are things, there are instances that I've read about, for example, where women came together and they were protesting, their protests, you know, had levels, right? They started off with communication, with conversation, they ramped up to protest, they ramped uh. up to, um, you know, nudity and, you know, using nudity as a form of protest, but they also ramped up to physical 
I would hate to say violence, but you know, physical intervention <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. on on men and on um, other people who were disturbing them and creating issues for them. So this definitely was not a passive approach. It definitely was not an approach to save the male ego. But again, going back to principle, it is an approach that one would take this negotiation I'm talking about. This is a principle that one would endeavor in if they are concerned about the survival and the health of the society as a whole. So in a collective culture, going back to that, they are um, really concerned with unity because just like Ubuntu, right? Just in, like in my response yeah. to Prof. Zani, yeah. mm. um, I am because we are. Yeah. So if, um, so basically the collective anchors every individual. Sure. And when they're thinking in that way, they are saying, okay, we need to address the issues that are coming up and address the inequity that's coming up but we need to do so in a way that would help us to maintain all of our relationships in the society and maintain therefore the health of the society. So they're using negotiation as a rhetorical device, as a strategy that yeah. would help to persuade instead of go out and, and strongly combat men. I mean, and, you know, we hadn't talked about feminism, but one of the hallmarks of Western feminism is this destructive combativeness and uh, when we look at nego feminism the feminism of negotiation that obioma nameka talks about it is not destructive combative tearing up supplanting men it's not about that right but there are levels to it don't get them wrong they're not going to play yeah. with you okay they will come after you but yeah. they're not going to start there okay so i just wanted to really really make that um make that very clear no, they were genius. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think um, Ambassador Jerry is really in agreement. So I think you are answered, Ambassador. Sure? No, I am. I'm, I'm very impressed by the thinking at that time. It's, so we had women leaders uh, since many, many years. I'm very impressed. And thanks, uh, Professor Martin, for those inputs. Yeah, thank you for yes. your question. <laughs> yes, I think you would really tackle that question quite nicely, um, uh, Prof, because one of the things I was actually going to ask you now is if you wanted to have any um, closing remarks, maybe for about two minutes, but I know you did um, also add a touch on some of the respondents' inputs as well, so I'm not too sure if there's anything else that you would like to um, say um, before we bring it to a close, because I can see that we don't have any more questions. Yeah, um, I just want to touch on something quickly that I said to Prof Zondi's response, because he was wondering if there was any conflict in women being political, but also having a non-political stance. And um, I would say for some women it was because Margaret Ekpo, who was another large figure in that time period, she actually uh, separated from the Federation of Nigerian Women's Organizations and the women's movement. Uh, because she was so faithful to her political party and she did not like the fact that the FNWO was non-aligned with political parties. So there, there again, there was that divisiveness that the non-political stance was trying to avoid. But for some women like Ms. Kuti and others, um, they, were, they understood that there was, again, with like I gave the example of Ubuntu, there is this personal as well as collective Right? So the collective anchors the personal, but that does not assume because you're a part of a collective that you are no longer an individual. You're still an individual. So in their individual lives, right, women could have whatever values they wanted and they could be a part of these political parties. But in the collective, in order for the survival of the collective, you have to put sometimes so the it, the ideal mode would be for your individual leanings to line up with the collective leanings. If that didn't happen, you had to be able to choose and put the collective, if the collective uh, leanings were important enough, if the collective agenda is important enough, you would then say, okay, I'm going to support this collective no matter what, even if there are some parts that I do not align with or that my political party doesn't align with. So that's something that, that we have to also consider. There was individual and there was collective leanings. 
So I think that it's really interesting to see that these highly political women are also saying that, oh, we're non-political, but at the same time, they're fighting for political awareness and political power for women. Um, but again, they were doing that to kind of preserve their own dignity, autonomy, freedom in their movement, right? Um, and the last thing that I will say is that uh, Dr. Uh, Dorcas, I really, really appreciate your summation of my presentation and the four points that you gave. That made me feel like I came here and I slayed dragons. <laughs> I did, in essence, I did what I was supposed to do. And you got the point. I think that others also got the point. I was very happy to see how you, you know, um, brought everything together. So thank you so much for that. And uh, hopefully I will, you know, be invited back to talk about uh, more of the way that they defined non-political nationalism when my book is out. Awesome. We look forward to, 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 to reading your book. And like you said, if you should make a stop and essay, we definitely want to be part of that. Um, colleagues, I was going to bring it to a close, but something has been brought to my attention. I'm not too sure if Ms. Ada, is it Ada Martin, was um, still has a hand or she has been answered because I don't see a hand, but uh, someone has just um, alluded to the fact that um, there was one more question. Are we missing a question from Ms. Martin? Hi, Doc, I don't see a question at the moment. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, that's my mom, so. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my mom, that's wanted... Mama Martin. <laughs> so, um, I don't know <laughs> if she had a question or if she's able, or maybe if she's able to type it into the chat or anything, but. Well, the hand is not up right now. So maybe mom oh. has decided to. <laughs> okay. Well, I definitely, I can always answer her <laughs> offline. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you for that, Prof. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, that brings us to a close of this very um, awesome conversation. You know, you've got us all thinking about a whole lot of things, you know, about strategy, about women's approach. Even myself, early, earlier on, I, you know, I introduced myself as the head of the public health um, um, your research units, a lot of um, some what, what you were saying about strategy and approach was really reminding me of some of the things one has been interrogating in some of the policies in some of the, you know, uh, you know, some of the analysis of sort of like African Union work and all those things that and, and how um, women's issues are brought about in the different uh, strategic approaches. And now I'm, I'm understanding more and better. So thank you for that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Dokas. Thank you, um, Dr. Philip. And thank you, Dr. Zainab, for your awesome, you know, uh, and thought-provoking um, responses to this um, wonderful presentation. Colleagues, um, I think because there are no more questions and um, we've all got each other's emails and we all have been invited to look out for Prof. Martin's book when it comes out. Thank you for your time and um, I, I suppose I declare this um, webinar closed. Have a very good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank thank you. you so much, uh, Dr. Banda, all the best. And um, uh, Professor Martin, thanks so much. I think, I hope we can celebrate Me Kuti more and more, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think we have, I don't hear much celebration about, uh, I hope it's somebody that can be celebrated all the time. And thanks for sharing. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye. Jobs, thanks, and all the best. Thanks, Ambassador. Bye. Thank you. He said he's going to be one of the respondents that he nailed that he has put her. I, I need all the responses. Well, I will, I mean, I'll get